right. Welcome to my panel. I'm Ink Maven. You'll find me in the dealer's den. Uh, I've been doing illustration in the furry fandom specifically since I was like 14. Um, I've been dealing at cons since 2016. Suffice it to say, I've dealt with a lot of character designs and a lot of references, and there are some things that I've found work particularly well and some things that don't, both with the design of characters, but also within the design of the references themselves. So this is kind of a two-part panel, uh, a part for references and a part for your concept in general. Hopefully there will be a little bit for everyone, regardless of whether or not you have a character already, you have no characters, you're creating your first one, or you have multiple and you're working on creating more from that point forward. Um, yeah, so let's just dive right into it, and I'm going to try not to talk too fast, because I do that a lot. We're going to start out talking about character design a little bit, specifically in reference to like anthro characters and furry design. I want to start out with a little disclaimer. Uh, design is pretty subjective, like even in art, rules are meant to be broken. These suggestions that I'm about to give you are exactly just that, suggestion. Like, the TLDR of this whole half of the panel is you do you. Like, especially where personas are concerned, your character is probably an expression of yourself, what makes you you, what makes you unique. Um, and first and foremost, like, looking great and your design being technically sound should always take a backseat to you having fun and enjoying yourself and feeling comfortable within that character. So, like, I'm here to give you some advice. Whether or not you take it is entirely up to you. First and foremost, just have fun with the characters you design. Uh, throughout my time designing characters, there are a few things I've come to find out that work really well in certain circumstances. Um, so some good tips for character design. Hard-edged markings always work really well. Um, that means one color butts up against the other. Not necessarily that it has to be a straight line. Um, you can do hard edge colors and have some like fur texture in there. Um, this is going to make it really easy, especially if you're commissioning like suits, because uh, people will be able to butt up colors of fabric on fabric. Um, making sure your species is clear on your reference sheet or clearly labeled when you're working with an artist. Um, some artists, particularly those who have a more realistic style, like to use references. And if I know your character is a fox and not a coyote, or a coyote and not a wolf, that's going to be very important for me when I'm looking at the reference stage. Um, even if you, as a person, don't really care that much about the anatomy, your artists will thank you if you have your species clearly labeled. Um, thinking about design and intent. Consider what you might be using the character for when you design them. Um, are you making a character because you want it to be a fursuit? Are you making a character because you're a, like, a commissioner at cons and you'll be working with artists who do a lot of traditional art. Are you a person who is a fairly prolific commissioner online and you work primarily with people who do digital artwork? Like, what is this character going to be doing once it's created? Um, simplistic, and I, I mean that in a subjective way, or strategic use of detail is also an important thing to consider. If you're not an artist, the word economy might mean something different to you, but in an artistic sense, uh, even though it can be weird to hear, it essentially means that, like, what, or what I'm meaning is uh, having an economic sense of detail, choosing what areas to have those high detail spots in, like tattoos or like lots of spots, and then balancing out those areas where there's little to no detail will let your important eye-catching elements actually be like more so, um, as opposed to covering your character head to toe in very detailed things, people won't really know what to look and their eyes will be able to focus on those important elements. Another thing you can consider is how to match your form to your function. Um, if your character is big and buff and tough, or if they're really cute and sweet, is there maybe a way that you could relay that to the viewer without them actually knowing anything about your character through the shape language that you use in their markings, or even their color palette? Uh, some bad, in heavy quotations, things. Um, RGB and CMYK style bright colors or palettes. What I mean by that is not don't use neon, because neon is great in character designs. What I mean is, especially where digital art is concerned and traditional art, you want to be able to give your character, your artist, somewhere to go from there. So, like for magenta, my suggestion is to grab a color not all the way cranked up in the top right hand corner of the color picker, but somewhere around in this area, because then you've got the area in the red circle for an artist to 
punch up that saturation if, if they're in a particular lighting or pull it down if they're in a really dreary scene. Um, if your artist is adding highlights and shadows, certain colors like bright CMYK magenta or green cannot be any more further saturated than that and they can be really hard to shade. Um, same thing with solid black. Solid black is really, really hard to shade because most often artists will use black as their line art color. So if you're working with a character that has solid black markings, not only can you not shade any darker than solid black, but also you're going to have to either color the lines or do what most artists that I know do, which is cheat and pull that color swatch into a very dark, dark gray and use that color instead so that they can shade back to solid black. Um, as I was mentioning in the other part of the panel, intricate markings can be really hard for like specifically for suit makers that might need to be like hand sewn or airbrushed. And if that's what you want to do, if you have an artist that has that sort of skill, great. But um, a, a big theme in this panel moving forward that you'll hear me mention is basically that as a commissioner, detail equals time and time will equal money. So that's something to keep in mind. And if you have very intricate markings, you may be may need to be prepared to be charged a complexity fee. So going back to that thought of like, what's your character for? What are you using them for? This is the first thing I always ask myself when I'm designing a new character. Um, if they're being used for a fursuit, some things you might want to consider there that you might not with commissioning art is like, what color is your character? What's the palette? Are those colors going to be easy to find in fur? Are you going to have to order something custom? Are you going to have to go with a color that's sort of similar and then airbrush it to the right color? Does that color just simply not exist in fabric? Um, shape. Not just the shape of your character, but also how does that shape fit around your body or the body of the person who's wearing it? Um, markings. Can they be machine sewn or are they going to need to be airbrushed or hand sewn? And what's your budget like? If you really have no budget, you might be able to go ham, but you know, being able to think about like how you're using this character and like in the planning process of the design, understand that it's being made for a fursuit can like literally save you money because you can keep those things in mind and make sure that it's like a fursuit friendly design. Um, if you're commissioning art, uh, basically, your complexity. How easy or hard is this design to replicate, not just for the artist, like how much time is it going to take them, but if an artist is working on a small canvas, say like a five by seven piece of paper, are they going to be able to fit those details into something small? Are you commissioning traditional artwork or digital? As we were talking about in the last slide, does an artist have enough time to, or enough room to lighten or darken those colors so that they can get that nice full range of vibrancy in your character in different scenarios? That sort of thing. So this is uh, my character, Otter. We're going to take a look at her character sheet. Um, I did a couple of the things we've been talking about for her design that I want to point out here. I did also break a couple of my rules. Um, I do have a couple areas of complexity, her tattoos, namely. Um, I think it's important to her as a surfer that you know she has those elements. So this is not a character I've ever used for a fursuit, because those elements might be a little too complex. but. I have given any digital or traditional artists who choose to reference or use this character, those references of the tattoos off the body of themselves. A digital artist could just take these and slap them onto the character, warp them into place, and then paint over them if they wanted to, as opposed to drawing it all from scratch. Um, yeah, most of her markings are hard edged. There are a couple areas of soft edged markings, but they're used fairly sparingly. I do use neon colors, but this yellow isn't cranked all the way up to the middle of the, to the corner of the RGB scale. It is just a little bit slightly down from there. So an artist has a place to go. And uh, yeah, we'll come back to Otter's reference a little bit later after the second half of the panel. So I wanna talk about color a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> color is often the first step in the design process. And if you're not an artist, you might gravitate sort of towards something like, yeah, I want a character that's black and red and white. Uh, what that means to you might mean different things to me, and I always love to play with color because, you know, there's something to be said for a red, black, and white character. There's nothing wrong with that. But 
I'm going to have a lot more fun working with these colors, and a suit maker would have a lot more fun, provided that there's actually like these colors in, in fabric with these sort of palettes and being able to play around with things. But it's not just all about fun. Um, it also is uh, technical, like I was kind of stepping into earlier. Uh, I highly recommend, if you have a character design consulting an artist, if you are not one yourself, because an artist can help you get a more diverse and more interesting palette that's going to be more unique to your character than maybe the first thing that you come up with. So taking these two palettes, the top and the bottom, and talking more on technical terms, this is uh, those colors with a simple overlay for a highlight and a multiply layer for a shadow, which is a pretty common trick amongst, amongst digital artists. Some colors can't really go anywhere for that. This red, the overlay layer, basically doesn't exist because what it does is it increases the saturation, and this red is already as saturated as you can go. Multiply and overlay don't work on solid black at all, period. Um, so I just wanted to point out any differences. It's a little hard to see because the color is slightly different there than it is on my screen. But the, the different variations of color that you can get in a palette that's a little more unique and a little more like off of your solid RGB colors. And uh, yeah, rolling from that into a character that I own, who is red, black, and white. This is her original reference. I bought this character secondhand, so I did not do this art. Um, We'll also talk about shading later. Please do not ever shade your references. Please. <laughs> uh, but this was the reference I was given. She had a lot of different art with some inconsistent character traits that were like changed over a couple of years. So I wanted to take her and give her a revamp that included some of those elements, but also sort of elevated her palette a little bit. So she went from this to this. Uh, still a fairly solid red, but with a little bit of orange thrown in. She also has some peach to match that in her inner ears. The black looks black up there, but you can still see the line art. It is not quite solid black. It's also a little bit red. And then I've taken her white and made it more of an off-white. So any artist who now colors or works with this character is going to have a lot easier time shading on top of these colors than these colors. Let's talk about marking for a moment. Uh, for toony suits, unless you want to do a hard-edged gradient between a couple of colors, which can look really cool, I highly recommend avoiding gradients because your suit maker is going to have to try to figure out some way to translate that into solid blocks of color. Um, avoid the uh, use of gradients on refs as well for the exact same reason. Use your contrast to accentuate the shape of the character. We'll talk about that a couple slides later. It's really fun. Keep your sewing in mind. Um, stripes and spots and tattoos and all sorts of detailed markings might require hand sewing, and your fur suit maker might like that. But here again, we run into the time is money sort of thing. Uh, if you're working with an artist who's more realistic and they're super great at airbrushing, um, maybe you don't need to follow those rules. Uh, I have a character who's covered in spots, persona so I would probably go for a realistic suit. I really like this image, Artist by K-Hound on FA. When I'm working with people who are trying to design their characters for the first time but don't have any visual references, I usually send them this. It's nice to have pre-existing markings. It's like sort of a menu almost. And people can tell me, I want face marking number two and tail marking number six and eye marking number four, and I want the ears to look like three. And even if your character has other markings than this, this can be a really great visual, or even like pointing out other references that have certain markings that you want. So yeah, I highly recommend using this for your character endeavors in the future if you're working with artists. Another marking I want to point out that is not on this sheet that I'm a huge fan of, it doesn't really have a name, but this like color contour between the underbelly color and the body color. I think this is especially great for suits um, because there's already a seam there. So you're not really creating any extra work in the patterning for your suit maker, but it can also accentuate lots of different types of bodies. So we've got a big buff tough man over here. We've got this lovely fox lady on the other hand, other side. And uh, yeah, I think it's just very, yes. You're talking specifically about the lines going down the waist. Yes. Okay. Yep, between like the belly color and the, the full body color, usually, usually. 
And there's like different lengths and different sizes. So this guy's got the orange one, and then we've got the yellow over here, black, and this is the black butting up against the white on the orange. But yeah, it's a very simple, very easy marking that's not super complex, but I think adds a lot to character designs. Um, expanding on that a little bit, here are some examples of some character designs I did with royalty a while ago. Disclaimer, the bird is not for sale anymore. That's just the only version I had. Mm -hmm. So talking again about hard edged markings, um, use of gradients fairly sparingly. They're on the feet and on the chest, but otherwise the markings are fairly hard edged. Uh, yeah, contrasting colors, no solid black. These white colors look solid white up here, but they're slightly off as for mentioning before. And both of these characters, it's a little more subtle on this one, but both of them have that, that curvaceous uh, marking between the belly and the body. Uh, I just made this reference recently for a commissioner, and I want to talk about breaking those rules a little bit. So this is a character that I used some soft edged gradients on in places. Uh, the commissioner liked the look of that. And um, you know, just making sure that your markings are easy to reference, even if they are soft edged. So hopefully an artist would be able to pick this up and understand that the, like the black markings, for instance, are lower on the back of the limb, on the back of the knee, and higher on the front, and vice versa, even though those markings are a little bit softer. But everywhere else on the reference, up across the chest, we've got some of those hard edges, but there's some fur texture to add some variation. Yeah. And we will segue from that into references. So reference design is not quite as subjective as character design is. Um, others may disagree, but overall this is like, this section of the panel is stuff that I've found working as an artist with people's reference sheets, what I like to see. Uh, first, I think it's important to define what a reference sheet is, uh, what differentiates it from a different type of commission. So a reference sheet is an illustration designed specifically for reference. It's a map that you've created to allow artists to recreate the thing on the reference. Its primary purpose is not to have a nice composition or tell a story or to be aesthetically pleasing, although those can all be bonuses. Its purpose is to serve as a template uh, so that other people can create your character in a way that's consistent. So due to this, um, whereas like a nice full body commission would just be that as a standalone thing, and that can absolutely serve as a reference if you don't have one, it might also include things like details, uh, shots, color swatches, and other extra information, even some text like height, weight, gender, that your artist might need to know when they're drawing your character. So. If you are a frequent commissioner, if you're getting a, like a fursuit of your um, character, having a reference sheet and putting the money into that will pay dividends forward, not only in money, probably, in getting things changed around and maybe having artists like charge you extra when you need, when they've missed some detail or something, but also in time, going back and forth with artists, you're not constantly going to have to remind them like, oh, my character has earrings, but only on the one side, or their spots are specifically like this. Your reference sheet can communicate that to them for you. So the ultimate goal of a reference sheet is to provide an artist with that roadmap so they can create more art of your character. But more so than that, like you should be able to receive art of your character. Your reference sheet should speak for you. Um, ideally, a really well-crafted um, reference sheet might be used to create art in situations where you are not involved. Like if a friend wants to get you art for your birthday, then you're not going to be able to be there as a liaison with that artist. And you still want that art to come out, you know, consistently. So I want you guys to ask yourself as you're crafting your references moving forward from here, could you hand your reference to an artist without ever speaking to them and receive art back and not be worried that they might mess something up or miss an important detail? So some good ideas for reference design specifically. Um, be succinct. Less is more. This fandom is very large and it spans multiple countries and you never know if you're going to be communicating with an artist where English is their first language. Um, that being said, I have definitely worked with some artists who will pop my messages into Google Translate and vice versa when we talk to each other. And anything that's on my reference, they won't be able to do that with. 
So unless they, you know, can, can read that text, I always find it's important to leave like your character's backstory or even things like height, gender, name in either if it's on the character sheet, also duplicate it into like the text comments underneath the submission of wherever you're putting that art. Uh, detail shots. It can be great to communicate smaller elements that might be missed. Again, using the analogy of like if someone were to get you gift art and there's an element you wanted to make sure that an artist doesn't miss, but you're not there to specifically tell them and point it out, you might consider doing a detail shot on your reference to basically do that for you. Some common mistakes for reference sheet designs. Uh, poorly designed color swatches or no color swatches at all. Um, a lot of artists really like to make sure that they get your character's colors specific. For me, I like to pull from a color swatch because then I know that when I'm doing weird things with lighting, and like an orange character might look more brown once I've added like a dark red light or something like that, then at the very least, I'm working from a place that started from that reference. Um, yeah, if your color swatches are poorly designed or too small, your artist is probably going to pull those, those colors from the places on the reference, but if your character has like 10 different colors, especially if it's a bunch of gradients or like, I just recently looked at a reference the other day that had 10 different variations of gray on it, mm -hmm. it was really hard for me to tell which gray was where, and if I'm pulling from the, the, the colors on the character, I basically just have to guess. Um, adding unnecessary detail to your background, you need like tons of text like I was mentioning before, or other elements that don't really add much substance to your reference will distract from it, and an artist might have a hard time using your reference and noticing the important elements if like the background is too noisy or vice versa. And same thing, like having too much information in one place can serve the same purpose. Going back to that first point about poorly designed color swatches, um, this is what I'm talking about. So, like usually a box or a circle or like an elongated swatch where all the colors are lined up against each other is great. This sort of thing looks cool, but we were just talking about how your reference should serve as a reference first and as an aesthetic piece later. This is definitely more of an aesthetic choice and why it can be problematic is because of something called artifacting. Artifacting happens when you pass images between each other on like Telegram or Twitter and it sends in a way where the image gets automatically compressed by wherever you're sending it. Um, and as that happens over time, and as that image gets passed and passed and passed, I'm sure we've all used GIFs and memes that have just been passed around and are super horribly artifacted and pixelated. That can happen to your reference too. And these very thin little color swatches are no longer a solid color. So you're not gonna get an accurate read off of these color swatches, which essentially means that they're not serving their purpose anymore. So let's come back to Otter now that we've talked not about characters only, but also about the design of her reference sheet. I want to point out some things on her reference sheet that are technically working well. So for one, the text is minimal. It's basically just her height, her name, her weight, her build, which is important to her. So I made sure to note that where I might not on other characters. Um, the markings suit her as a character. Um, I'm just curious, without knowing anything about this character, if, if you guys could give me some adjectives that you think might suit her. Athletic. Athletic, sure. Yeah. Confident. Confident. Um, did you have one? Yeah. I'm sorry, what was that? I said me and Zach. Yes. Okay. Uh, oh, chill. I, I, I think yeah. I was cool, you said? Cool. I'm not just cool. Cool. <laughs> I guess you might have a little bit of sass. Yeah. Uh, at first glance, I would assume that this character lived on like an island or something, like Hawaii. Yep. Actually, you're totally right. Um, <laughs> this is the the main character for a comic I kind of have in the back of my brain that is set in like an adjacent furry universe version of Hawaii. So no, but... yeah, I spot on. She's confident. She's spunky. She's a little bit of a tomboy. Um, she's kind of rough around the edges but is still feminine at times. Um, so I tried to give her fairly like thin streamline markings, but that came to points. Um, her palette is pretty brown and muddled, but she does have those spots of excitement with the bright yellow. For this character in specific, um, it's also very important to her 
that she's a surfer, like that's part of her identity. So I added her surfboard to her reference, not only for the sense of scale, but also because quite frequently if I commission art or draw this character in the comic, she's going to be seen with her surfboard. So it's important that that character and that prop go hand in hand. Um, as far as her necklace goes, that's an important, not only theme for her, but also like a narrative element in the comic. So I made sure to give it its own little detail spot and its own color swatches. This is another reference that I recently did for a client and I would like to open the floor, the floor to you folks. Um, I want to know, based on the information you've been given in this panel, what do you notice that is going on in this reference sheet that I've been talking about here? So, like, she's tiny. <laughs> she is tiny. Mm -hmm. She's very tiny. It does, yes. And to avoid having any sort of like text labeling on that, just to be super extra careful, I labeled it with a little image of the feather. So regardless of people's ability to like read English, hopefully it should still read that those colors are attached to that specific part of the character. It is very clear. Cool. Glad to hear. Yeah, what, what else about this character sheet do you see, or this character design that's working? The labels on the gradients, and, or not on the gradients, the labels on the swatches, and you have multiple colors in some of them to indicate uh, like what kind of gradient they might have. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah, there are a couple of gradients uh, used sparingly, mostly there's the spot on her chest and then the gradient right between her eyes. So she's got two belly colors, just in case people want to cross-reference those for the gradients. And then the dark spots also have two for the gradients as well. Yeah. Cool. So, I yeah. the clock color is not completely black. Yep, that's true as well. Nor is the black on the feather, actually. You were totally right. Yeah, so some things I noted. Um, she has hard edge markings. This is a like a redo of this character, and she asked me to refine some things, and one of the things I did was remove almost all of the gradients, but I kept them in places to offset the hard markings. As you mentioned, the, the feather markings have a little feather by them, but also the feather itself has a larger detail shot, just so people can see like the piercing that attaches it to the ear, and then they have the visual reinforcement of you know, scale and whatnot. Um, and then there's limited text. So the only text that's on this reference sheet is her name, her species, her height, and a couple of words about her personality, just in case, you know, for whatever reason, her friends want to get her gift art or something, then artists know how to characterize her. So yeah, I did the thing I said I wasn't going to do, even though I slowed down how much I was talking and how quickly, and we burned through this panel in a half an hour. <laughs> so. I will open up the floor to you guys if you have any specific questions about anything that I was talking about. Sure, go ahead. So one of the things that I struggled with when trying to like do references to my character, mm -hmm. I, like I I don't draw, I, I suck at drawing, I, it's hard spatially and visually. Mm -hmm. What do I do? Do I like can I give somebody like a written or vocal character description instead of like writing, drawing it? Yes, um, a lot of artists I know will work off of description, but also this is a really good point to clarify what it says in there. I have a point on that, uh, just because I've done the same thing. Like, made, a made a character, I don't really draw very much. Um, I, like, I've just talked to people, I've developed mood boards. Those are, yeah, characters. those are really nice. Yeah, uh, like just pictures that you've seen on the internet, like put them in a collection in a folder. Like, I want to design a dragon character. I like these styles of horns. I yeah. like this color as the base color, you know, yeah. that sort of thing. But also, there's a lot of free resources out there for like reference sheets of like fairly common species. Even if you all only have access to like a free liner and a phone, and you're like, all right, I'm going to scribble out that I want these markings roughly here. Like, that's great reference for an artist, especially accompanied with, like, a, a text yeah. description. Yeah. Like, literally anything you can provide an artist with, even if you don't have the skill to produce it yourself, is going to be super helpful for them. I was going to add on to that, mm -hmm. but you basically covered it already, that even if you think you're a terrible artist, any visual reference is yep. better than no reference. I've received stick figures before for like full illustrations, and that's like 
Perfect. It's My great. first persona was actually like basically chicken scratch drawn into a, like a line reference, and that developed into the first fursuit I owned. Yeah. So it definitely works. And actually, like artists can riff off of that stuff too. For this client, I was just told like Red Fox. They were specific about how they wanted the arm markings to be, but otherwise, um, one thing that I incorporated is they sent me a shot of their fursuit, which was already created, so this was a reference based sort of off of their fursuit. The way the fur ruff on the neck lined up with the fur ruff on the body, and the way the, the two white lines lined up weren't exactly even, and they had this really cool curve in them. So like I incorporated that curve into their actual markings and asked the client, like, do you like this? Because you know, like it makes your character a little more unique. It's not gonna be super hard to draw. And they were like, Yeah, that's really cool. So that's how that ended up happening. I love it. Sometimes yeah. you can just have like fun little accidents like that. Yeah. And this character was literally based off description. I was looking on like because I didn't want to uh I wanted a snow leopard character, mm -hmm. but I couldn't like you know, I didn't want to, like, the spots were a complication for me. Like, I couldn't, like, do that on a line sheet. So I yep. I found somebody on Reddit, and they designed it, and nice. they turned it into that. That's cool. Yeah, yeah artist choice would always be really fun, too. Sorry. Oh, yes. Yeah, go ahead. What was that? I think I'm going to be that now as an author character on Theater Forms. Oh, oh yes. yeah, that's a really cool idea. <laughs> yeah, I hadn't even thought of that. You had a question? Yeah, on the topic of zones for uh, color and how you should avoid uh, full saturation or full mm -hmm. white or black. Is fixing that as easy as just taking the RBG picker and sliding it in one direction, or is it more complicated than that? I mean, more or less. Here, I can pull it in Photoshop. Like, <laughs> my character is black and white, and uh -oh. that's like... My screen's just black now. Come on, buddy. Could you let <laughs> I believe in you? <laughs> Oh, okay. Oh, all right. PowerPoint's done. It's done for the night. It's cashed out. It died. Ah, it came back. Thanks, friend. Except you're, you're a day late for the con artist panel. It's all right. <laughs> Photoshop. All right. So, I actually still have an agenda for making the thing. Um, yeah, so like full saturation. Are you saying like editing an existing ref? Uh, so my character is currently uh, just literally black and white, and mm -hmm. so I need to fix that. Gotcha. Well, um, if your reference is already done, it's no, really... No, it's... <laughs> all right. In progress? Yeah. Oh, cool. Um, yeah, I mean, basically that's a note for you if you were to commission or create a reference sheet. You would just want to, like, either just grab a color swatch yourself. So, yeah. like, solid black is just a bunch of zeros. Yeah, my, my current state is... I'm trying to make my own ref, but I'm not finished yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it really is just a matter of like just finding a color you like. What I would do, what I would suggest to you, is if your character is just solid black and white, is there a color you really like? Uh, red. Okay, because what you could do is like go into the red range and pull a little saturation too. Because this color, like colors all the way down even in this range, still read as black. But now there's a little bit of red in there. So if I, as an artist, got your reference and saw that your character was a reddish black, that might incline me to include some more red in the image, either like in your character's clothes to match it, or like if I'm doing a batch for you, maybe I pick a red paper in the background, and you can kind of like subtly encourage artists to work with colors you like by picking colors that match with them. Or you could get them to do a complementary color mm -hmm. to it. make it to make it stand out more. In which case, you could do like a like a greenish. Hmm greenish black. Yeah, I, I wholeheartedly suggest you, especially when you're working with colors like white or black or gray, instead of picking a solid unsaturated color, just just squeeze that a little bit into the color range and find something just slightly more unique and go with that instead. Because it's, it's fun to test the boundaries of like what color reads as what, not only on its own, but like when it's paired with other colors. That can be fun too. Yeah, like, when you go crazy with the saturation, it can make an image hard to look at, and, like, mm -hmm. it, it make, it'll strain your eyes just looking at it because yep. of the contrast just messes with it. But it can be a really good tool to make something more visually intriguing if you use contrast in, like, a positive way, like mm -hmm. mixing it with low saturation 
colors to make things pop more. Or, or like I was saying with uh, markings, like having areas with like high complexity balanced with areas of low complexity, you can do that with color too, where you have areas with high saturation balanced out with colors that are low saturation. People do that very frequently with like, they'll pick a bunch of gray colors. I'm just going to slap some colors down on the panel here because we got time. Mm -hmm. You know, like if I'm going to go with like a almost an acidic looking color palette, then I might pick something kind of like that. And I'm balancing out that bright cyan with some grays or bright, wow, bright chartreuse, excuse me. <laughs> I know colors. I'm an artist. I don't. Um, but you can also do the same thing with like some nice browns. We're all good. It looks really natural too, but still stands out. What color should we balance out these browns with? Blue. Yeah. You could use the blue for like eyes or something. This, the color on my monitor is very weird. I don't know if anybody else has seen how bright and saturated the cyan is down here, but when I actually like put it on the palette, yeah. Yeah. is this a CMYK? Huh. It is a CMYK. That's the problem. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Why is CMYK a problem? Good question. I, I mean, like, you can't get as vibrant. Like these bright colors. neon colors don't exist in in CMYK. Like in, I mean, it does. It does. Wait, that's not. It's cyan is in CMYK. It's the C in CMYK. Why is this doing this? That's a good question. I'm too tired for this. I don't have an answer for that. I don't know. Um, it's because the color palette, I think, was selected in our PG, but. Oh, that could be. That could be. I don't know. This isn't a Photoshop tutorial. I'm gonna. Yeah. <laughs> Suffice it to say, absolutely take your colors, your your really bright saturated colors that you like, and balance them out with with other less saturated colors. You can get a really nice harmonic palette that way. Yeah. Any other questions? I can't think of anything. Cool. Um, I'll be here tomorrow in the dealer's zone as well, so if you think of any and you're just like, oh man, I forgot to ask during the panel, because I know I'm one of those people that always thinks of things like five minutes after they're relevant, I'll be around. I'm always happy to answer questions. Otherwise, thank you for coming to my panel. Uh, I hope you enjoy. I have a question. Sure. <laughs> yeah. 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 I can't wait five minutes, but... Um. <laughs> For the uh, reference sheet, is it better to have like a T pose or a more naturalistic pose? That's a good question. I usually go with whatever pose isn't going to like obscure markings. I try to keep the pose fairly open, but I will also, this is one of those things where like form matches function, right? If you've got a really edgy, I'm going to stand up and we're going to be standing up. If you've got like a really edgy character, instead of posing them like this, you might want to pose them like this. Or like, you know. You can say a lot about your character based upon how they're posed or like what their limbs are doing without turning their limbs or like covering them or putting them in a place where it's going to obscure the ability to actually reference that character. That said, if you have like maybe you'll take an intricate lightning bolt and like off her side of the character's body, then you're gonna want to do a key pose because you want because you know you're gonna want to side view her for the artist to see that like, intricate markings right there. Oh, it turned off my internet. Give them attitude. Is your Wi Fi still on? Good. Good. Can I bum off of it still? Thanks. You, you mentioned. Hyatt meeting. Get out of here. Hyatt meeting. Friendship ended with Hyatt meeting. Now is my new best friend. Uh, Gosh, I hope so. <laughs> Here we go. Okay. So a little while ago, I did a reference for a character who has some merle on his thigh. It's not a thunderbolt, but what I ended up doing, since the tail like covered up that side of the ref, was just doing a little cutout. Um, it might have even been better now that I have the experience I have to, so instead of doing a back view, do just a side view of this character, or at least a partial side view, so people had the full turnaround of what that merle looked like. And then, of course, this character's scarf was an important prop for him, so I gave it its own little vignette. Yeah.
Is that something you can do? He's also got that, he's in the panel, he's got those fun squishy markings. I should really come up with like a descriptive term for those, but yeah. Torso stripes, yeah, that's a good one. Oh, another thing I didn't talk about really is the breaking of my own rules uh, and shading. There are opportunities where I use shading on references, and it's usually to communicate material types. So usually the only thing that I will shade on a reference are like the nose or the eyes or anything that looks like slick and shiny, like the metal on the spell. That being said, I also make sure to give clear uh, color swatches that are unshaded for anybody to pull color from the swatches instead of from the character themselves. So like, there's the eye swatches over here, the metal swatch, and then the paw, paw pad swatch. And the nose too? Yes. And I probably should have labeled these two swatches because they're a little too close together to know which one is stripes and which one is skin. I think I can figure um, it out. Another thing you can do on your references that I started doing recently, if we hop back into PowerPoint here, is you can give a really good indication of where a color is supposed to be located. Oh, okay, we crashed. Ah, by putting that color swatch near where the color is located on the character. So like, I didn't label these color swatches because these are pretty straightforward, but I put the claws and the paw pads near where the claws and paw pads were, and then I put like the skin near where the skin is on the reference sheet, and then that way I avoided any text labeling because just the context of where the color was on the reference in accordance to where it is on the character is close enough that it just like visually ties them together. So that's another way you can get around that. Yeah. Any other questions? Like you said, like pure black, uh, but like how far from pure black does it feel good? Uh, I mean, the the short answer is however close or far you want to get. But let me slap down. Generally, as long as you can see the line art. Yeah. Yep. That's that's where I was about to go with that. You're totally correct. Um. Let's make a little circle here. We'll make the stroke black, and then we're going to fill solid black. And then I'm just going to change the fill until we can see a clear delineation between the inside of the circle here and the line. Actually, there's a better way to do this. So like, let me know when to stop. When can you see it? I mean, I can see it right there. Yeah. Barely. So let's check. So this color is just like ever so slightly above black. And you could go more than that, but I probably wouldn't go less. Yeah, definitely not less. Because then I would just look exactly the same. Yep. Yeah. Thanks for coming, guys. I really appreciate it. Hope you learned some stuff. Do you have business cards on you? I do not on me, actually. Uh, so you will be at the vendor's thing yeah. tomorrow? Yep. You can find me at Ink Maven Art, uh, Teal Tablecloth, awesome. cute little whale shark buddy who's been holding on to my business cards all time.